Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Tarina Ahuja. I'm a sophomore at the college studying social studies with a secondary in ethnicity, migration, and rights. I'm a member of the John F. Kennedy Junior Committee as well as the chair of the Harvard Civics Program. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on JFK Street side gesture of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you. Please also take a moment now to silence your phones. Please take your seats and join me in welcoming our moderator, Juliet Kayyem, and Governor Deval Patrick. Good afternoon, evening. Oh my goodness. Good evening, everyone. It is so good to see faces here. Last time I was here uh, was the last forum event before uh, we all went home for a year and a half. So I'm thrilled to be here. I am Juliette Kayyem, and it is a unique honor for me to introduce Governor Deval Patrick this evening for the Seymour E. and Ruth B. Harris Lecture. This prestigious lecture, established in 1975, reflects the Harris's de desire to recognize and celebrate public service. The Harris Lecture is held biennially in honor of Seymour Harris, an economist here at Harvard for more than 40 years. He was also a dedicated public servant and served as economic advisor for John F. Kennedy's presidential campaign and as his chief economic consultant in the Johnson administration, among other public roles. Past Harris lectures have included such distinguished individuals as Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper, former and present United States Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, and Janet Wolfenbarger, the first woman to achieve the rank of four-star general in the U.S. Air Force. And now, added to that list is Governor Deval Patrick. My relationship with the governor as a boss, twice, mentor and friend is of significance, is of more significance to me than to you or even him. Uh, Deval <laughs> hired me for my first government job in the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. He would bring that division back to life under President Clinton, aggressively promoting cases against police brutality, voting rights, defending affirmative action, leading a task force regarding nationwide arsons against black church and supporting school integration efforts. These cases and policy priorities were so meaningful for so many citizens who had felt abandoned by a division whose mission was to ensure their equal status in society. Years later, he would tell me in my dining room that he was planning a run for governor. I don't want to say I humored him, but the thought seemed wild. Deval Patrick as governor of Massachusetts. Raised on the south side of Chicago by a single mother, earning opportunities at Milton and Harvard and Harvard Law, the governor ran an improbable campaign that led to a magnificent eight years in office. The nature of those years was defined perhaps by its very beginning. Breaking with tradition, he moved the inauguration from, the, from inside the Massachusetts State House chambers to outdoors on the west portico of the State House. It was for the public, not the political elite, signaling a more open and accessible government for a new Massachusetts. Duvall was the Commonwealth's first and only African American governor. I, he, and honor, in honor of the role of freed slaves in America who were his ancestors, he took the oath on the Mendy Bible, the one given to Congressman John Quincy Adams by the freed slaves uh, from, the, from the ship Law Amistad. I served then as his Homeland Security Advisor, a new role in the post 9-11 world. And in that capacity, I saw again his wisdom, strength, and progressive vision. He understood the necessity of safety and security for the people of the Commonwealth and his leadership later, and his leadership later during the Boston Marathon bombings became a vital symbol of hope for a city and nation in fear. He rejected calls for hate and instead spoke of unity, even love. I would also be subject more than once to a particular Deval Patrick trait. I see his former chief of staff over there and he's gonna recognize this. When skeptical of our advice, he would simply lean forward, his eyes now visible over his glasses with a look that said, without him saying so, I'm unconvinced. I got the glasses, he would sometimes say, and, knew, and we knew we had to get back to work to make a stronger case. It's clear now there are many ways to describe Deval Patrick. His successes in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors are a model for many of us who do not see their careers unfolding in a linear way. 
an NAACP legal defense fund attorney, a corporate law firm partner, an investor in companies founded by minorities and women, the head of the Civil Rights Division, an advisor for the government on everything from police misconduct to the future of our economy, a board member, an author, a husband, father, and grandfather, a governor. Deval Patrick, however, may best be described as an architect. This idea came to me from his equally accomplished wife, Diane. My husband and I were visiting a home they had built in the western part of the state. It is a home that is at peace with its surroundings. Diane told us that when they bought the property, Duvall would visit with a camera and sometimes even a sleeping bag to understand the light, the earth, and the movements of this commonwealth. He learned of its beauty and designed a house as well as where to put the beehives, something he cultivates personally and will tell you make the best honey around, with the earth's movement in mind to absorb rather than overwhelm its beauty. As an architect, the famous one Norman Foster once said, you design for the present with an awareness of the past for a future which is essentially unknown. I think these words actually best describe Deval Patrick. The past, present, and future. It was this focus that led him to bring a challenge at the Civil Rights Division promoting lawsuits against the Citadel and the Virginia Military Institute's male-only admissions policy. The past could no longer hold. The present demanded justice for the women who sought those schools' military educations. The future would eventually be the end of the combat exclusion rule against women in the military decades later. The past, present, and future. It was this belief that led to a gubernatorial campaign that was less about him and more about this state. To have seen what Duvall did, engaging young and old across racial and ethnic divides in a state with plenty of them, was to see the potential of what the Commonwealth could be. When he became governor, he unleashed a new generation of leaders who had not, who had not before seen the possibility. Our state legislature changed, our congressional delegation changed, and the next mayor of Boston, who will be a woman of color, will change. As governor, among his many successes, he pushed for an increase of our minimum wage from eight to $11, driving later a later national movement. And he invested in the Massachusetts of the future, biotech and clean energy, carefully, respectfully, pushing us from our past, offering a vision for our future. Drive in Kendall Square today, past the offices of Moderna and Pfeiffer, and know the impact the governor had on a, on a pandemic he could not have ever imagined. It. The past, present, and future. As governor, he convinced successfully the state legislature to prevent a ballot measure overruling the same-sex marriage in Massachusetts, where our highest court had just recognized it for the first time in the nation's history. The politics were demanding a return to the past. It was 2005. It would be eight years before, uh, uh, before it was eight years before President Obama, the, the governor's close friend, would say the same. 10 years before the Supreme Court said the same. The governor fought back and won, protecting same-sex marriage in this state. He could not have known what would unfold later, what seems so natural now. And as he said at the time, citizens come before their, citizens come before their government as equals. The past, present, and future. We tend to think of a divide between public and private sector contributions. They are different, of course, but this school succeeds by empowering students whose careers may take many turns, but that wherever they are, they can do good works. As an investor, his focus has been on minority-owned businesses, recognizing that in the past, it is access to capital that has hindered communities that do not often have a seat at the table. Ask Richelieu Dennis, the founder of Sundial Beauty Products. Uh, Mr. Dennis, a war refugee from Liberia, sold his products on the streets of New York City. After a cold call, Patrick knew that he was the future of our economy and he would better serve underserved markets. See, Sundial creates products to serve the unmet professional beauty needs of consumers of color. It was a great beginning and a happy ending. Sundial was eventually acquired by the global juggernaut Unilever. It's no wonder that President Biden has appointed Deval Patrick to co-chair the Future of Tech Commission, where Patrick is focusing on the goal of universal affordable broadband, based on his earlier efforts to deploy federal funds to expand high-speed internet in rural parts of Western Mass. Deval welcomes all to the table, maybe because he was often the first one with a seat. 
and at every seat he has held, it has set a foundation so that others might build for the future, which is, in architect Norman Foster's words, essentially unknown. We learn from the past, design for today, and build for our, for our children. We can have no better architect than Deval Patrick to help us understand what it means to lead in this America. When the past seems forgotten, the present feels disheartening, and the future can seem unnerving. It is with immeasurable respect and gratitude that I welcome you here tonight. Thank you. Oh, yeah, wow. Thank you so much. Mercy. Julia, thank you for that extraordinary introduction. I, I, I would, I'd like to invite you to my funeral. Um, <laughs> It's kind of a grim way to start, but you understand <laughs> what I'm saying. Um, I thank you, I thank uh, the Dean and the Executive Director of IOP and the whole community here at the Kennedy School for having me uh, today. I was told I was supposed to fill up a half an hour or so with, uh, with my own remarks and then we can have some conversation and I hope, uh, I hope we get to do that. Um, soon after the uh, 2008 presidential election, Mitch McConnell, at that time the Senate minority leader and the most senior Republican in Washington, famously declared that his job was to make Barack Obama a one-term president. We, we were in the middle of a global economic emergency, the sharpest downturn since the Great Depression. People everywhere were out of work and increasingly out of options. According to McConnell, people were evidently also out of luck. Coming in in the midst of a public emergency, the comment shocked me. A reporter asked me what I thought about it, and I quipped that I thought McConnell's pledge was seditious. That shocked the reporter, and I was chased down the halls of the State House with reporters asking me to clarify or expand on what, for me, was an uncharacteristically sensational remark. My own team got busy trying to walk it back. Am I right, Doug? <laughs> Of course, once Republicans gained control of the Congress, they succeeded in harassing the Obama administration on multiple fronts. And though Obama won a second term, despite McConnell's resolve, Republicans did manage to stall out much of his legislative agenda, from gun safety measures to immigration and criminal justice re reform. For that, Republicans claimed victory. Democrats claimed a similar victory recently. Now, I should acknowledge that I am a proud Democrat, not the sort of Democrat who thinks you have to hate Republicans to be a good Democrat, but a proud Democrat nonetheless. But Democrats get on my last nerve. <laughs> it frustrates me that for a long time now, we have been the first ones to believe Republican talking points leading us to negotiate against ourselves and tamp down our own policy ambitions. So I was gratified during this last election cycle that so many of our own policy positions on climate change, on job and wealth creation, on public safety were ambitious. I don't agree with all of it, but at least as a whole, the agenda looked uh, to address big, stubborn, systematic cha changes with bold solutions. When neither the infrastructure nor the Build Back Better bills passed a couple of weeks ago, action on the one being conditioned on approval of the others, some Democrats claimed victory. Both of these examples leave me wondering just who Republicans and Democrats in Washington think is winning. Perhaps it's an indication of my political naivete that I believe Americans ought to expect better of their elected leaders, especially in times of national crisis. But candidly, I'm worried about our democracy. Now more than ever, political leaders use division as a public health measures and work hard to make it harder for people to vote or to have that vote counted. Many downplay, some even encourage a deadly assault on the Capitol to overturn an election. From voting rights to money in politics to hyperpartisan gerrymandering to sedition itself, the Congress utterly and the Supreme Court so far refused to serve as either a check or a balance. To me, American democracy, the supposed model of the form, seems up for grabs. The retreat from these 
processes of democracy like ballot access, legislative debate, judicial review is worrisome enough. What's even more concerning is the retreat from the promise of democracy. The rule of law as superior to the rule of any one personality. Liberty and justice for all. The notion of government of, by, and for the people for the purpose of enabling the will of the people. Democratic institutions and norms are essential, but they were always about a means to an end. They were conceived to support people-centered aspirations. And while it is important to acknowledge that that then radical concept was originally limited to white people, it endures, I believe, because it envisions a means by which to promote the people's collective aspirations. That isn't happening nowadays. And meanwhile, the people are hurting. For just a moment, consider whether the unemployment rate or the minimum wage or the Dow Jones average quite squares with what you know to be true. Consider the numbers of people all over in the wealthiest country on earth without a place to live, without enough to eat, without a job that enables them to make ends meet, without a doctor. Consider the people around the country in this digital age who have no or inadequate access to broadband or even to cell service. Consider the families in this age of education whose children may learn how to escape a mass shooting in their local school, but not to read. These are not new conditions. Our COVID times have just made it harder to overlook the deep disparities among us in health, wealth, and education, or the deep unfairness in too much of our policing. Harder to ignore the racist habits that have confounded us for so long. Wildfires and droughts in the West, storms and floods in the South, and extreme weather shifts everywhere with resulting crop and livestock failures make the climate crisis as plain as day. President Biden rightly says that the world is watching to see whether democracy is up to meeting the challenges of our time. If the promise of democracy is to serve the people's needs and aspirations, early signs are worrisome. What we get instead are Republicans using calls for racial reconciliation to drive a wedge between whites and blacks, between rural and urban, between working people and so-called coastal elites, while Democrats urge candidates and advocates to use different talking points or change the subject and otherwise quarrel among ourselves. All of it is part of a formula for political positioning. I understand that. That's how we get the kinds of victories I cited at the outset. But the people are once again secondary. All the while, the economic uncertainty, social isolation, despair, and cynicism about politics itself that white people in rural areas, small towns, and many a suburb experience today is exactly what black people have known for generations. In one form or another, with work changing or disappearing altogether, with wages stagnant, with addiction and suicide on the rise, and with sustained help hard to see ahead. Americans everywhere are left questioning whether our national commitment to social justice and economic mobility is real. In the words of one friend of mine, the self-evident truth that all people deserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness seems a long way from settled in the American mind. Indeed, whether democracy today is about any of that or any of us is a question worth considering. Many view Massachusetts as a reliably blue state. In my experience, the political dynamic here is less about Democrats and Republicans than about insiders and outsiders. In the first place, there are more independent or what we call unenrolled voters in the, in the Commonwealth than there are registered Democrats and registered Republicans combined. More to the point, there is an awful lot more of the business of Beacon Hill on a day-to-day -day basis that is about the wishes of the well-connected than about the unmet needs of the general public. That is increasingly the norm in Washington as well. 
where leaders can, with a straight face, claim victory when nothing happens. Few seem to be able to step back from the necessary heat of politics, the positioning, the maneuvers, the coalitions, to remind us of the light, if you will, of democracy's promise. In my short but intense political life, I tried to do that, especially in times of emergency or significant controversy, to center both the people I was trying to lead and myself. I want to offer this evening an account of what I was trying to do, a couple of examples of where I think that approach helped or at least didn't fail, and some ways to assure that democracy's promise has a chance in the end. In large measure, for me, it comes down to patriotism. I grew up on the south side of Chicago in a crowded two-bedroom tenement with my mother, my sister, my grandparents, and various other relatives who came and went. I went to big and broken, overcrowded, under-resourced, sometimes violent public schools. And yet my grandmother would never have us say we were poor, just broke she'd say, because broke is temporary. Here was this refugee from the Jim Crow South who still believed in an America where through hard work, preparation, playing by the rules and faith, religious of course, but also civic, you could lift yourself and your family above your circumstances of birth. I have tried to keep up my end of the bargain by working hard, by preparing, by playing by the rules, by keeping the faith. In my journey, America has mostly kept up hers. There were food stamps when we were hungry and affordable housing when we needed shelter. There were well-prepared and loving teachers in those public classrooms, grants and affordable student loans for college, an economy expanding to make room for me when I was ready and a reliable bus or subway to get me to that job and home again safely. I am the symbol and the result of my grandmother's faith in America, and America deserved, in that case, her faith. I owe it to her to be a patriot. But you see, patriotism for black Americans is tricky. It's difficult to love a country that doesn't always love you back. Think of the black men who fought for freedom in the world wars, but were denied that very freedom when they come home. Those examples of some lynched in their military uniforms. Think of the black laborers who built great public universities whose doors were closed to them, or the black voters who elected great public leaders whose policies like the GI Bill, were closed to them. For a lot of our history, American democracy itself has been closed to black people. For black people, America has not always kept up its end of the bargain. Lots of grandmothers like mine had grandsons or daughters who never got their chance and still don't. I remember in college, a white classmate asked me, why on earth would you want to be black? When I told her that I hadn't considered the alternative, <laughs> she seemed startled and com confused, maybe because you know, I spoke and dressed like a preppy, but mostly because she couldn't imagine a black person of right mind who wouldn't eagerly trade places with her. I think it would blow her mind, as perhaps it does some of you, if I told her I was a patriot. Americans often seem nonplussed that somebody can love America and simultaneously acknowledge, let alone work to fix, what's broken. I don't know when patriotism got reduced to lapel pins and flyovers <laughs> and arguments about whether foot, pro football players should take a knee. True patriotism, it seems to me, is about national aspiration. America is the only nation in human history organized differently than other kinds of countries, not by geography or religion or race or language or even a common culture, but instead, instead around a handful of civic ideals. And we have defined those ideals over time and through struggle as equality, opportunity, and fair play because these 
are what make freedom itself possible. That's the America my grandmother believed in, that black men and women had enough faith in to die for in foreign wars and to march for in the streets at home. That's the America that has made us a magnet for talent and ambition from all over the world. That's the America that, it, that makes me and countless other men and women of every race and background a patriot. That's the America, I would argue, even the founders envisioned. And that's the America whose democracy seems to me up for grabs just now. Per per perhaps because it depends in the end on what commentators sometimes call small r Republican virtue. Because indeed it depends on people, democracy turns out to be quite fragile. In one form or another, I tried to talk about this all the time. I read somewhere that politicians really have only one speech, repeated in various iterations over and over again. That's probably true in my case. I found that emergencies in particular, when confusion, chaos, and anger make really fertile ground for division, were when I kept coming back to themes of patriotism, of civic faith, Again, to ground those I served in the common cause at hand, but also to ground myself. It seems we had more than a few emergencies in my time in office. I'm not talking about the self-created ones. We had weather emergencies like freak snowstorms, destructive hurricanes, and a tornado that ripped through western Massachusetts. We had physical emergencies like the collapse of the ceiling just before the uh, election in the then new Ted Williams Tunnel that killed travelers, or the breach in the water main that threatened to deprive nearly half of the Commonwealth's residents of drinkable water for months. We had the Great Recession, as I have mentioned, and the calamity it brought to so many for so long. But the example that best illustrates the peril of division and discord was, I think, the bombing at the Boston Marathon in 2013. Most of you know the story in its highly distilled version. Two bombs went off near the finish line, killing three people and injuring over 260 others at the scene. Two young men from Cambridge were identified. And then about 100 hours after the attack and a series of events that ultimately resulted in two more deaths, the bombers were killed or captured. All of that is true, but I can assure you what actually happened was considerably more complicated. Without recounting all the details, it's important to understand that we did not know at first that there were only two bombs and only two people who planned and carried out the attack. On the morning of the capture of the surviving bomber after the shootout in Watertown the night before, federal authorities chased a suspect near the courthouse in the seaport area. A taxi supposedly with explosives in the trunk was stopped and isolated in the Fenway, and the Kennedy Library in Georgechester was on fire, all within about an hour of one another. A couple of hours after that, I ordered the early Amtrak train from Boston to New York, stopped and searched outside New Haven because of evidence the suspect may have escaped on board. In the course of the day, we sent a SWAT team to, uh, by Black Hawk helicopter to search a dump and a dorm in the South Coast, and a, guy, and a guy in what he claimed was an explosive vest presented himself and walked toward the command center in Watertown, causing a standoff and tense negotiation with heavily armed police and the rough evacuation of Mayor Menino and me to the far side of a building. I mention all of this not for the drama, but to indicate how volatile the circumstances were until they suddenly weren't and how easily it would have been to stir up hysteria and vigilantism, especially once we, to we knew and told the public that the sus suspects were immigrants and Islamic militants, which we all know are hot buttons for many. Instead, we had a prolonged period of common effort and constructive contribution, not just from law enforcement, who on the whole showed restraint, collaboration, and professionalism despite all the jurisdictional overlap and adrenaline. But from everyone, whether or not they had an official role. 
the first responders and medical teams, the recovery workers and public transportation staff, and most movingly, the ordinary cit citizens who by sharing their selfies and videos helped law enforcement puzzle out who was responsible and through countless acts of kindness and grace behaved as members of one community. That was not by accident. I tried to be intentional about setting that tone. In addition to keeping the public generally apprised of what we were learning and the many decision, practical decisions that I and others had to make from moment to moment and day to day, many of them with imperfect or incomplete information, I tried to balance our grief and righteous anger with the need to keep the community together, positive and facing forward. I talked the about the importance of keeping our civic faith, our commitment to build and to defend the notion that members in a community have a stake in one another, that we turn to each other in times like these, not on each other. On the advice of an uncommonly wise young man who worked with me at the time, whenever I did a press conference or interview, I tried to lift up those acts of grace by ordinary citizens alongside the diligent efforts of officials. Because at the back of my mind, I knew that Boston Strong could have easily, as easily become a rallying cry for vigilantes as it was a byline for resilience, unity, and civic pride. I hope and believe many people who lived through that experience came away understanding that the spirit on display reflected the best in all of us. What I tried to do was evoke a spirit of patriotism. Now I promise you, I am not trying to sound grand. In these divided times and angry times, I am under no illusions about the risk of getting a great big eye roll from any one of you in reaction. I remember after a particularly brutal round of legislative setbacks, I told President Obama he ought to try, quote, wrapping himself in the flag a little more. What the hell is that supposed to mean? He snapped at me. If looks could kill, I'd be dead. Any leader in the thick of the contest recoils from advice that seems so trite and abstract, or naive and unconnected to the fight at hand. But every leader also knows the importance of setting the tone, its context for your opponents and your allies alike. And in our present circumstances, a constant and urgent call to patriotism may be all that's left. Thanks to laws proposed or passed in many states today to authorize partisan officials to invalidate an electoral outcome they don't like, the cornerstone right of all people to vote and have their vote counted is uncertain. The Congress won't step up to strengthen voting systems to limit the influence of money on elections and policy or the distraction it has become to members from governing, to make health care universal or affordable or even to save the planet from burning itself up. The courts have been weakening the kinds of programs intended to make the American dream possible, like access to quality schools or colleges or jobs in private industry or the ability of a woman to choose how best to plan her own family. At the same time, the Supreme Court has been, has been busy weaponizing the freedom of speech to justify corporate bribery and the freedom of religion to justify discrimination. There is a similar and related phenomenon that has been happening for decades on the private side as well. Capitalism as a means of enabling people to reach their highest potential has been discredited by nearly 50 years of winner-take-all behavior, where the winners take everything except responsibility for those who help them win. Income and wealth inequality are at levels that concern economists across the political spectrum. And the level of confidence in capitalism as a system has declined sharply, especially among young people. And the people, we the people, are left with a government that ignores the choices we want on voting, job creation, business regulation, taxes, energy, abortion, and gun safety. An economy where it is harder to break in, harder to move up, or both, 
and a national community where most of us from whatever background or part of the country feel unseen, unheard, and angry. This is not what should happen when democracy works. In a way, the founders, for all their flaws, designed America to be a nation of values, a country with a conscience. We have struggled with and against that conscience from the start. But in the end, the values we say define us add up to this. America cannot be great without also being good. We cannot be great without a good growth strategy, one that grows opportunity, jobs, and wealth out to the middle and the marginalized in every part of the country, not just up to the well-connected. We cannot be great without good public safety and respect for the rule of law, not with unaccountable police or excuses for an assault on the Capitol. We cannot be great without good border security, one that acknowledges our realities, our needs, and our compassion instead of caging refugee children to discourage their parents or deporting others to a collapsed nation. We cannot be great without good gun safety measures, not by tolerating mass shootings and consistently choosing the wishes of the gun lobby over the lives of innocents. We cannot be great without those few good measures we know help people help themselves, not by letting public schools continue to fail poor children or young families and seniors go without health care. To some, this, I'm sure, sounds just like a liberal policy wish list. But to me, not only do the labels fail us, they distract us from the point. American democracy works when it serves its promise, when it's about us, not about partisan conflict, performance art, and inaction. Different people and different parties may differ on the means to achieve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No one person and no one party has a corner on all the best ideas. But the promise of our democracy ought to keep calling us to listen to each other without losing our temper or our self-confidence, and back to small r Republican virtue. And that's where patriotism comes in. In America, patriotism demands more than ceremony and sanctimony, more than what you say you believe. It's about living the values that make liberty possible for all, even when it's inconvenient, even when it gets in the way a partisan advantage, even when it compels us to be mindful of and compassionate towards the lowly, the vulnerable, the different, and the despised. Because that's the promise of American democracy. Of course we have policies to fix, whether in job growth or education, in immigration or the justice system, or in these processes of democracy itself that I've described. But before we can fix our policies, we have to fix our politics. And I'm not talking just about hyper-partisanship or a willingness to compromise. I'm talking about reasserting democracy's promise, about remembering in the heat of the debate that social and economic justice was the point from the start. In my last year in office, um, America faced a crisis not unlike today's when unaccompanied children, some as young as three and four years old, were flooding across the southern border, having fled over thousands of miles from violence in Central America. And just like now, the federal authorities were overwhelmed. So President Obama asked a few states temporarily to shelter and care for some of the refugee children until they could be processed under our laws. Now, feelings around immigration ran hot then, just like now. Even so, I agreed that our state would help because accepting the challenge temporarily to shelter poor children fleeing unspeakable violence was to me an act of patriotism. America has given sanctuary to desperate children for more than a century. We rescued Irish children from famine, Russian and Ukrainian children from religious persecution, Cambodian children from genocide, Haitian children from earthquakes, Sudanese children from civil war, and our own children from New Orleans from Hurricane Katrina. Once in 1939, we turned our backs on Jewish children fleeing the Nazis, and it remains a blight on our national reputation, as I fear the recent separations of children from their parents will surely be remembered. My point is 
that our esteem and our power are enhanced when we rescue desperate children and diminished when we don't. Still, I knew our offer of shelter would be controversial. Indeed, for that decision on hate radio and social media, I was called everything but a child of God. A couple of days after I announced my decision on an unusually quiet Saturday morning, my wife, Diane, gave me a list of stuff to get from the local Home Depot. It was early in the day, and I, this happens. It was early in the day, and I thought I would just slip out quickly on my own without uh, bothering my security detail. What harm could come of that, right? I knew exactly where I was going and where to find everything on the list. So I set off in the truck dressed in a t-shirt, jeans, and flip-flops, a baseball cap, and dark glasses. Didn't matter. I was outed by the manager in the very first aisle. Governor Patrick, he said, welcome to the Home Depot. How can I help you? <laughs> I encountered a man in the checkout line who was red hot angry, not hostile or threatening, just really mad and loud. And he let me have it. Governor, he said, I couldn't disagree with you more. He said, my own wife is an immigrant. She came here legally and that's the way it ought to be. I want you to know I think you are wrong. Now, in that moment, it wouldn't really have helped uh, engaging with him on how being a refugee is legal under American law or uh, him with me over the arduous bureaucratic process his wife had surely had to endure to enter the country legally compared to those who came the way these refugee children had. It felt to neither of us like the time or place. He wanted to register his anger and his frustration. And he wanted to make sure everyone else in the checkout line knew too. <laughs> so I simply acknowledged his views and thanked him for his feedback. Now I had six other encounters in the store that day on the same subject. And in every one of those, someone came up and whispered, Governor, I'm with you. Or Governor, you're doing the right thing. Or Governor, thank you for helping those children. The calls to the office were two or three to one in favor of sheltering those kids. It struck me on reflection how we've come to shout our anger and whisper our kindness and they're completely upside down. I don't know if that comes from the reality TV, social media culture we live in or what, but I do know that it's time we learned again to shout kindness, to shout compassion, to shout justice, that's the promise of American democracy and the source of our greatness. I, for one, am encouraged by the many polls and other reporting, as well as several recent articles and books that suggest we may be a lot less divided on many fundamental policies than we seem. But I think saving our democracy will take more forms of shouting kindness from each of us, more of that small r Republican virtue. It will take elected officials learning to spend political capital, not just accumulating it, to move voting reforms that place trust in the American people, to try new ways to serve our civic ideals instead of just their own interests in reelection, and to focus on how policy touches people instead of just how it may curry the favor of donors. It will take business leaders moving away from the failed vision of shareholder primacy and an overemphasis on short-term financial returns to the notion of stakeholder capitalism, where the interests of workers, the community, and the planet take their rightful place alongside those of owners in business strategies to build long-term value. It will take a media willing to moderate the unimportant instead of amplifying it just because it's sensational and to call out fact over objective fiction. It will take collaborative problem solving between and among political parties, as well as the private and public sectors and philanthropy, a willingness to try new solutions and new alliances to address stubborn problems. But more than any of that, it will take us, we the people, reasserting our collective, collective will to be heard, seen, and served, not instead of, but alongside our neighbor. It will take all of us everywhere registering 
turning out and voting in record numbers, staying engaged between elections, to hold those we elect accountable for keeping promises, and talking and listening to each other, modeling the notion that we don't have to agree on everything before we work together on anything. It will take us choosing products and services from companies that model and respect the values of shared prosperity and long-term value, using our economic power. It will take us choosing to read and watch those news outlets that report facts with integrity, that respect opposing views, and that stop treating democracy as if it could tolerate endless abuse without breaking. Blessedly, we're starting to see more and more people coming off the sidelines, standing up for America at her generous and optimistic best. From women who are demanding to be treated with the respect and decency everyone deserves. From survivors of domestic violence and abuse demanding to be seen and heard and believed. From the black and brown people who are demanding consistent professionalism and the presumption of innocence from the police from students who are demanding we choose their lives and safety over the proliferation of military weapons in civilian hands, from all those lawyers who showed up at polling places in 2020 or in airports after the so-called Muslim ban demanding respect for the rule of law, from business leaders leading mission-driven companies to benefit people and the planet over the long term, not just to benefit a few owners over the next quarter. Black Lives Matter, Time's Up, Black Girl Magic, Occupy Wall Street, Families Belong Together. They come by many names. And at any given time, on any given issue, they may make any one of us uncomfortable. But in their own ways, each has put their cynicism down and taken to the legislatures, to the ballot boxes, to the courtrooms, to the marketplace, and to the streets to lay claim to their democracy, its promise as well as its processes, and ultimately to affirm an American conscience. They are shouting kindness. If American democracy is to have a chance, more of us had better summon up our own patriotism and join them. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's terrific. Thank you. Watch the water. Yeah. Okay, it. wonderful. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, we are removing the podium so you can see both of us. And thank you very much, Governor. Can I take uh, this off to drink it? Is that you're allowed to. Yes, permitted? for drinks. We will not. Uh, I will give you a moment to have a drink to describe the rules. Now, there are now two microphones right here. We welcome questions. If you could identify yourself and ask the governor a question, we will, um, we will begin there. Uh, and or, we will do or this comments for a few or minutes. Advice. Or comments or advice or whatever. But yes. Welcome, please start. Hi. Hello, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm a Strother, MPP1. Hi. As an educator, I am curious about your, thank you especially for your thoughts on patriotism and on shouting kindness. Yeah. How do you see the role for Gen Z currently in this movement and in your vision for patriotism? Well, I have to say, I think, um, first of all, is Gen Z, everybody here? I'm a millennial. What are you claiming? as your generation now? What's the name of your generation? I think we're millennials for the millennials? most part. Millennials, so Gen Z's younger? About 10 years younger than I am, it's about 18 years old. Okay, I won't ask you how old you are, but uh, everybody seems more and more to be younger than me. Um, <laughs> what I love about what's happening right now, um, you know, inconvenient or uncomfortable as it may make uh, some people, um, I, first of all, I want to acknowledge largely peaceful, that's really important. Mm -hmm. But it feels like this generation has put its collective foot down and said, we're not doing this anymore. We're not gonna keep the same old patterns. We're not gonna let the same things kind of go by. We're gonna ask harder questions. We're gonna challenge. I think that's enormously important. But I don't think um, 
and I, this is not a comment about a generation, this is just a, a view about um, what I think works and doesn't. I think if all we do is replace official performance art with grassroots performance <laughs> art, we have not done the work. The problem with change is that it's a whole lot slower than we'd like, and it takes changing people in power and then influencing people in power or putting yourself in places uh, of power to make change that lasts. And, the, the, and I, I just want to add this, um, this point, because this is to my point about how it will take us as, as citizens, not titled, but as citizens, um, making choices, keeping pressure uh, on, showing up, not kind of saying, well, they didn't get it done in the first 90 days or 100 days, so I'm done. I'm never engaging uh, uh, again. We need a more, and, and by the way, and building new alliances. And that may mean talking to people who have called us everything but a child of God, but are willing on everything else, but are willing <laughs> to come to us and work with us on the issue at hand at any given time. And that, I gotta tell you, is hard. Because I've sat across the table any number of times from people I wanted to reach out and slap. <laughs> but I needed them to get something, uh, something meaningful um, done. You bring those coalitions together, I think that's how you, you get not just change, but change that lasts. Over here. Firstly, thank you for coming, Governor. My name is Aziz Richardson. I'm a first Aziz? year student at the college. Hey. And when Where you are you from, Aziz? Uh, New Jersey. Okay. <clears throat> and when you were talking about- You registered to vote, by the way? There's an election coming up. Yes, I know, the gubernatorial oh. election. <laughs> Can yeah, I say so that in here? Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> so when you were talking about patriotism, I was reminded about this quote by James Baldwin in which he states, I love America more than any other country in the world. Therefore, I reserve every right to criticize her perpetually, which leads to my question. How can us as, I guess, millennials are in here as well as Gen Z, maintain our drive, our optimism, our fervor towards making change, towards these big problems, when oftentimes these problems can seem insurmountable or intractable? So, um, question. For, you know, we've, we've been talking generally, generationally. I sort of feel like my, on behalf of my generation, I should apologize <laughs> for handing so much mess on to you and, uh, and, and my, my kids and, and, uh, and now grandchildren. Um, but I do think that um, one of the things that happened in my generation, and it has happened in other generations, is that we checked out. We, first of all, don't make the mistake of thinking nothing has changed. Don't make that, that's, a, that's an easy one. But I'm, I'm gonna tell you, a whole lot has happened that's good in my lifetime. Um, you know, the, even the idea, I and mean, you talked about marriage equality. When my I was lifetime. a kid, it was illegal for black and white people to marry. And you know, I realize that sounds like I'm talking about a time when dinosaurs roamed the earth, but I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is we are not the same country we once were. And what we have to do is learn to acknowledge the progress we've made at the same time we acknowledge how much more work has to do, has to happen. And keeping that in equipoise, I think is a part of, under, uh, a, a part, just a part of the optimism you have to maintain to keep getting it done. And to push past the folks who treat you as if, you know, to James Baldwin's point, if you are criticizing somehow or other you don't love this country. Mm -hmm. it's, you, it's a unique kind of country where you can, lay, you can make a claim of conscience because of how we were founded. Uh, because of those, that idea of civil, civic values or civic I ideals. And I, that, that's all I'm getting at. Don't, don't just leave that behind in the, in the, um, you know, the kind of haste we all have to be very concrete and very, you know, that having a reason for why it is you are trying to drive to a, a, a fairer and more just outcome is a really important grounding thing, as I say, for yourself and for the people uh, you're trying to influence. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Over here. Hi. Hi, my name is Anissa Andrabi. Uh, I'm a master's in public policy student here at the Kennedy School. And where are you from, Anissa? I'm from Los Angeles, California. 
Um, so my question, well, first I want to thank you. I appreciate um, specifically your emphasis on advocating w more for what we're for rather than what we're against. Um, my question is more about uh, the racial wealth gap. We're learning a little bit more about this and the roots of that in our core race and racism class. I've been thinking a lot about that lately. I think my question is really, given that owning a home is one of the key ways to um, acquire economic mobility, what do you see the role as um, state governments with the private sector in closing the racial wealth gap? Yeah, so I, I love this idea of, uh, of uh, home ownership as a wealth creation um, um, opportunity. I, I mean, that has been our history, broadly speaking. I'm not, let, let me, let's just presume that that's going to be the future, but I think there's some reasons to wonder whether yeah. that's going to be so. Um, there was a guy I met, um, really imaginative uh, fellow, who, uh, who talked about how, uh, and he, he's, a, he's a planner, and then he, so he talked about how um, we, we have these ways. He was talking, I'll give you the specific example. He's talking about, do you know this area, Roxbury? He was talking about how, um, you know, let us, let us say hypothetically, someone wants to build a 12-story tower in Dudley Square. And by the way, if you built such a tower in Dudley Square, the views would be magnificent. And he said, here's what will happen. The neighborhood will organize and say, we don't want that here because, and they will be right, this will create pressure on our rents and it'll make it harder for us to to live here. And he said to me, suppose the developer said, um, you know what, and, and you know, they have to go to the city and the city will uh, negotiate it. And you know what happens. The city says, okay, you can build, I don't know, 10 stories instead of 12. And you have to make a contribution to the local neighborhood association, let us say. Um, so all the consequences, right? It's a little lower. Or maybe you have to put a blend of affordable and market rate. Um, in there. He said, suppose you went to the city as the developer and you said, let me build all 12 floors. This is presuming at 10, it's still economic. And let me, um, let me have those two extra floors. And let me take the value and equity portion of that, you know, a stake in that, in that development and give it to the neighborhoods as, a, as an equity stake in that building. Either way, in the city's compromise or his way, the issue of um, pressure on the local renters exists. He said the difference is that instead of what we currently do, which is approve this thing and then figure out some new place, some new pocket of poverty for poor people, we create a stake in the wealth creation opportunity for the people in that um, in that neighborhood, in some, you know, radius you figure out. I bring this up because, to me, we need to be thinking about how we build a future that way. So it, it actually includes folks. I mean, there are other ideas out there. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets a home. Everybody gets a down payment. Some of this comes up in the context of reparations, for example, in the reparations debate. Um, we should talk about all that. But I'm just really interested in how, how is it we have intentional stakeholder engagement, wealth creation engagement, not just kind of keep the peace and mm -hmm. the folks who, uh, the investors get all the return. What's a real way to engage uh, in the wealth creation opportunity of the kinds of economic development that happens in growing uh, cities and that we want to happen in, in more and more places? So that's kind of how I think about it. We'll have time for two more questions. Let me take you over here. I'll keep it brief. Shorter answers. I'm Thanks sorry. so much, Governor. No, 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 no. Uh, my name is Orrin Adam. I'm an MPP1 from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, Orrin? Orrin, mm -hmm. you know. Um, particularly the introductory comments around rural broadband you know, stood really well with me sure. in a sense of uh, coming from the South. And so my question is, what do you see as the blueprint for tackling rural, bro rural broadband? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And I say that as someone who's from Tennessee. I worked for Governor Phil Bredesen's mm -hmm. Senate race, and part of his platform was utilizing the Tennessee Valley Authority to expand rural broadband. Yeah. Do you see that as the blueprint? It might be. Um, I mean, we, I don't want to, so I'm working on this commission um, right now. We're supposed to come up with a, with a blueprint on, 
on, uh, on access and equity as well as privacy issues and platform safety and so forth. And we are in the middle of developing our uh, uh, consensus around the recommendations, so I don't wanna, I don't wanna make news um, <laughs> um, uh, tonight, except to say, I know you want me to, but uh, except to say that, you know, I don't think there's any doubt about the importance of universal um, uh, access. I mean, once upon a time, this was viewed as a luxury, you know, you could, so you could watch movies and <laughs> games, but now it's about education and healthcare and public safety and commerce and, uh, and, uh, and access. So, um, and there is money in one or both of these bills pending in the Congress uh, uh, right now to make a big step uh, in, in this direction, if not entirely get it done, and that's something we're trying to sort out. Here's to your specific question about the TVA. We got money in the stimulus bill in the Obama administration when I was still here to expand broadband in, in, uh, uh, in Massachusetts because there are parts speci specifically in the western part of the state that are just like, I don't know, Appalachia. Um, maybe some of the communities in, uh, in Tennessee that you came to know. And, uh, and, and that are cut off in all those ways in large part, not exclusively, but in large part because of lack of access to broadband. And so what we did was use that m money to build the so-called middle mile, I'm sorry, oh, I know I'm going sorry. on. I'm the so-called middle mile on the assumption, this is the TVA model, that the private sector would come and do the last mile. Mm -hmm. So we built the middle mile and the private sector, sector did not. And that has a lot to do with differences in the economic model today. So there are some other things that I'm really, I mean, that may work in some places. It didn't work in a bunch of places here. There's some other models like these uh, local co-ops where the, where the local co-op finishes the work, which I happen to like because then they own the broadband. And there's a revenue stream that comes, not just to pay off the debt, but you know, to help out with the schools. And so I really love that model. That works in some places and, and others. But, I think what we're gonna find is that there is more than one way to skin this cat, as it were, depending on, on, the, on local issues, mostly having to do with geography, but this has gotta be solved and gotta be solved fast and probably can be solved in a relatively short period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, and the final question. Hello, thank you for coming today. My name's Sam. I'm Sam? a public policy student at the Kennedy School. I'm from New Zealand. Excellent. Um, I also have the absolute pleasure of being in Professor Kayam's policy class, mm -hmm. and we recently learned about success criteria. So, different context, but I want to ask you, what success criteria do you have in your life, hmm. and how has that changed over time? Success criteria? That's a good question. You mean, how do I measure success? Yeah. I, I would say, Sam, um, that I measure success by what lasts. Meaning, I, 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 I really believe in the, it's kind of an old fashioned idea of generational responsibility. We're supposed to do what we can in our time to leave things better for those who come behind us. And I think some of that, um, you know, is policy this or that, or, you know, that, you know my children and grandchildren, stuff like that. But I, I, I'll just say, and I know I'm going on to No, I, it, it, I'm there, enjoying there this. I'm having dinner with you, so I'm in no hurry. There, there are ways in which I am, I'm, I'm constantly reminded that you're having impact when you don't think you are. And I, 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 I've written about this um, experience I had when I was a, um, a teenager, and I was home on a school vacation from Milton Academy, and I was late to meet somebody, and I went running to catch a bus. And I got to the bus just as the, got to the bus stop just as the bus was coming up. And I jumped on the bus and it started to move and you know, they had coin boxes. You had to put the fare actually in the coin. And I realized as we were on the underway, I didn't have enough money for the fare. And I looked, I looked at the driver, ridiculous, and he pointed to the seat closest to the door and he said, sit down, son. And I knew he was gonna let me have it. <laughs> And I started to explain that I'd been away and I was in a rush and I didn't, the fare had changed and I was so sorry. And he turned from the road and he looked at me and, and just for an instant, and he, you know, he, he sized me up the way people who serve the public can do like that. Mm -hmm. And he turned back to the road and his expression softened and he said, just pass it on, son. Just pass it on. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a 
tiny act of grace. It made me want to be a better man. It's tiny stuff you do. I got a call two weeks ago, three weeks ago, from a young man who is the um, uh, vice chair or chair, I, I think vice chair of a community bank in Worcester where he grew up. And he said, um, I grew up in Worcester, I was a foster kid, um, my, um, my, uh, my foster mom was great, stayed in my life, um, but she was in a really tough neighborhood where I went to school. And he said, uh, when I was a teenager, I, um, I was trying to, I got involved in some gang fight. He was trying to rescue his friend and got stabbed in the face and nearly bled out. And he was hopeless and trying to recover and he got a job as a, uh, as a waiter, uh, he said, in a Worcester restaurant. And he said, we had a, um, an, a campaign event in my first campaign at this restaurant. And afterwards we stayed and had a bite to eat and he came over and introduced himself. And as he started to tell me this, I remembered him. And he said, uh, you asked me about me. He said, you talked to me. You said, you asked me what aspirations I, I had. And he, he said, I, and I told you I didn't have any. And I said, um, uh, he said, you said to me, that's not why you're here. You're supposed to look up, not down. You're supposed to look, uh, to look forward. And he told me that that made him decide to go back to school, to go get his college degree, to become a federal bank examiner. He's now back in Worcester as head of this, uh, head of this bank. I've had more experiences um, like that because you are, the, the thing about leadership is it's not up to leaders and you're leading when you, when you don't think you are, you know. There are these tiny things and when people come and tell you, teachers will know this, when they come and say, you know, there's something you did or said um, that had an impact when I, when I was open to an impact and I, I built on that, I think that's the thing to try to be for me, I try to be conscious of a little bit more, just more self-aware about, because I, in my own life, that has been so impactful. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank Makes you. a lot of sense. I want to thank the audience and the IOP for uh, coming tonight, and uh, uh, and re and to the governor for reminding us to to shout our kindness and to pass it on, which you have done for all of us tonight uh, and, um, and for so many. So thank you all for coming here and thank you so much. It was a, a wonderful pleasure. evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.